Welcome, everybody. My name is Bruce Knox. I am the director of the Unitarian Universalist Foundation Caucus. Uh, and I am also uh, the co chair with Bobby Nasser of the NGO Committee on Human Rights. So we do a lot of work together and it's definitely a human rights event. So thank you all for coming. If it looks like uh, sometimes I may not know what I'm doing, it's because Sabley Alamo and Kelly Diaz really helped put this together. So, big thanks. And if you see them waving their hands in the air or something, it means they're telling me what to do. And so, big credit to them. And I also want to thank my husband over there, Isaac Humphrey. Uh, he's actually live streaming this on Facebook. And hopefully, there will be a link afterwards. I have the link that people can look at it later. Um, I want to say a word or two about uh, myself and also about our office and what we've been doing. Here I'm a retired U.S. Foreign Service officer, uh, and I'm gay. I've already introduced you to my husband. And so, as you can see, just visually, you can see that we are at the intersection of race and sexual orientation and gender identity issues. We live that out as a family every day. And as I was explaining to some people downstairs before we started, we tend to look at issues in silos. And we don't live in silos. We live in a world and we have multiple identities and, and, we, and we have multiple causes that we work on. Uh, one of the very gratifying things that I've found as I have been doing this work, we do a lot of work on climate change and we have an awful lot of LGBT people working on climate change. So we all are passionate about the various issues. And this is a chance for us to look at these two issues um, together. So that's what this is going to be about. I came here to the UNO after retiring from the U.S. Foreign Service in 2007. I started here at the beginning of 2008 and started working on LGBT issues because this is a passion of mine. And when I first came here and I started my about lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex issues, people kind of looked at me as if I had farted or something. It was not, not very nice looks, actually. And, you know, but I kept, I kept insisting that, you know, this was, this was a legitimate human rights issue. And the more and more I talked about it, uh, the more it became acceptable. And there was an NGO DPI conference in Paris in 2008 on the, to commemorate the signing of the Universal Declaration rights, and they had planned to talk about the human rights of everybody you can think of, except LGBT issues, and I just kept insisting that that be included onto the agenda, and eventually it was. Um, so, and, and it's been a great sort of history since then. Uh, December 18, 2008, there was a statement uh, made at the UN General Assembly, signed by 66 countries introduced by the government of Argentina calling on the world to end discrimination and violence against people because of their sexual orientation and gender identity. And so that has just moved forward. Lately we've been seeing an awful lot of um, terrible things happening to black people, particularly in this country. Uh, this is now the decade of people of African descent uh, declared by the United Nations. And um, so it's I think it's high time that we look at confluence of, of both of these issues. So that's what this panel is, is going to be about. It's what our office has been about. It's certainly what the NGO Committee on Human Rights has been about for a long time. And related issues. Um, obviously, these are not the only two human rights issues uh, available, but these are the two issues that we're going to look at today. We've got an absolutely great panel. I am not going to go into detail um, introductions for our panelists, uh, because you have them all here, and, and I would rather you read them and take them with you and, and realize what fantastic people we have here, um, uh, rather than me reading these things to you. I have already introduced uh, Sebley Alamo and, and Kelly Diaz, our organizers of this, and so their bios are also here. Um, so I want to go right into uh, our, our speakers and have them give their opening remarks, and then we'll carry on from there. So, um, I'll begin with, begin with uh, Tanya Fernandez. 
who is a professor of law at Fordham University. And again, I won't read the whole thing, but we're very happy that, he, uh, that she's here. Fabrice Ogab is a human rights officer at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights here in New York, and also with the World Bank. So he's got a double persona there, and has done some absolutely amazing work um, both at the World Bank and here um, at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, Rush. Rashima, thank you. Sorry. Uh, last name, Fatma, is with a wonderful organization that I've known for years and years and years uh, called Outright Action International. I've known it for years and years and years. It's Eagle Earth, the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission. It's now called Outright Action International. For, in my estimation, it's the premier U.S. based international LGBT. Uh, Dr. Monica Motley is a professor of uh, education, community health from Virginia Tech. Um, so we're very happy to have you here. And last but not at all least is um, Betty Jean Luters Ward. Thank you. Uh, who is uh, in charge of uh, social justice at All Souls Church, which happens to be my church. And has a strong history in uh, social justice issues. So, uh, we would like to get very brief statements from, from all of you, and then we will go into our discussion. Uh, I don't know, we can take, do we want to go down the right and go? We'll start with you, so brief. We'll get the website for the end of the day. We'll be on the five minutes. They will time you. So, I go for the agriculture of human rights. Uh, and, and as part of it, we have the big uh, public awareness and education campaign for free and equal, uh, which, uh, which basically you know, tries to send the message all over the world that equality for LGBTI people uh, is an important issue at the United Nations, and that the United Nations is a mutual uh, matter. Uh, and indeed, the, the question of, uh, of racism is very relevant to the free and equal campaign. And, and before I came, I thought about four aspects, uh, which are uh, very relevant, uh, and I hope we have uh, the opportunity to discuss it today. The first aspect is that we must recognize that the LGBTI community has an issue with racism. Uh, you know, a few minutes before when we were downstairs with Bruce, we, with Bruce, we were talking about Washington, D.C., where I live for 15 years, and, uh, and Philadelphia, where gay bars are you know, incredibly segregated. Uh, there was even a gay bar in this I remember where all the white people were on the first floor, all the black people were on the second floor, and they entirely didn't meet. And, um, and this, uh, this, uh, this racism in the community comes out sometimes in pretty horrendous manner. Uh, so there's you know, a sexual network we have called Grindr, which is pretty well known in the gay community, and probably beyond that. Uh, and, uh, and you know, you have, you have horrendous taglines like no blacks, no femme, uh, no, uh, no fat. It shows, you know, that our community can also be full of prejudice. And so this is something that in the free and equal company are extremely aware of. Uh, we produced about 28 uh, videos every year, which objective is to change the earth and mind globally. And we are, uh, we are now trying to always be extremely mindful, not only about representation, but also about the way race is, uh, is uh, conveyed through the video. You know? And that's also true about segments within our community, like transgender people, intersex people. So are they represented in the material that we are producing? And you know, in which way uh, are, they, are they represented? I think the second aspect that, that I, I would like to discuss today is the fact that homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia is particularly heavy on the most marginalized population. And that, you know, there is a, a complex number of studies that have proven that. You know, the Williams Institute in UCLA that studies the uh, LGBT question has shown over and over again that poor people carry the burden of homophobia much more than the rest of the population. You know, they experience violence, discrimination, exclusion from their community much more. And uh, when I did a first trip to India in 2012, I remember having this very strange interaction with, uh, with the elite in which they 
told me that the status quo, meaning you know, basically not talking about the question of homosexuality in Indian society, was actually preferable to a tough, open debate on equality. But then when you would have a discussion with poor people in India, you would have a completely different problem. And the reason is because if you have money in India, you can you are able to build walls to protect yourself from homophobia, biphobia, or transphobia. Something you might not be able to do if you are already either in a poor community or in a marginalized community. And so I think this leads me to another interesting point, which is that we have to be extremely careful in social movement about who is leading the movement. And, uh, and you know, the LGBTI movement globally, but also particularly in the United States, has a representation issue, you know, meaning that mostly it's white, upper middle class, gay men that are speaking for the entire LGBTI community, even though their experience of their sexual orientation or their gender identity is, uh, is different. So there were two other points that I wanted to talk about, but I won't have time, but, you know, the discussion is uh, <laughs> starting. So the other, the other point is that there is a huge overlap between the fight against racism and the fight against homophobia. And very often the roots of homophobia and racism are kind of interrelated. And something that is very interesting is that colonialism, which is inherently racist, racist it has actually a tremendous impact on homophobia. And you know that historically and even today, one of you know, one you know, African leaders will very often tell you that they are against cultural imperialism and they see LGBT issues as being cultural imperialism. And then my last point will be that there is gigantic synergy between the fight against racism and the fight for LGBT equality. And, and you know, as Bruce said, we tend to work in silos. And we have to challenge ourselves. So it's not only about joining the racial movement, it's also about you know, working with the environmental movement, working with people with disability, working with gender. Uh, so that's it, and now I have been in my time. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Monica Martin. I am from Danville, Virginia, which is a small rural city um, in southern Virginia. So I'm very excited to, to be here today because I, I echo the sentiment that, you know, something like this for someone like me that shares all the identities that I have, being black, lesbian, gender fluid from a rural area, oftentimes our voices aren't included in conversations like this. Um, even though we're very much so on the menu as far as what to do about it. And then if we are included um, in the meeting, it's either in a tokenized way or an assumption that we are responsible for educating everyone about their privilege and their power, um, their implicit bias and or microaggressions, which in itself really takes away the responsibility and the accountability um, of those that are in privilege. Um, to do the work and to be aware and to be accountable. Um, and so um, I'm a research associate at Virginia Tech for the Center of Public Health Practice and Research. I forgot to start my time. There we go. Um, and um, what I do, is, as we mentioned, I really try and leverage research, public health, and social justice to try and address some of the most complex health issues. And the reason I got into this work is because growing up in Danville, Virginia, we are a medically underserved community. Um, we are probably 50, 50, well, 50, 49 percent split between um, African American communities of color um, and white communities. Um, and as was mentioned, I, I saw and observed a very real difference when it came to community negatives, how segregated they were. When it came to what did the people look like that were leading local policy making and decision making um, in Danville and the state that it didn't look like. And then what was the conversation around getting involved around racial justice and equality? Um, LGBTQ equality was a not conversation because we're still very much at a zero zero one level um, and talking about racial equity and equality. And the term intersectionality, you know, this is the work that I do um, and work in Florida and Danville and other places in Northern Virginia, is a word that most of um, and so, as a person with multiple marginalized identities, I love to quote um, Archie Ward, and I don't know her checker out, that there's no hierarchy to my oppression. 
meaning I don't experience my dignity in life one day as a black person, the next day as a woman, the next day as a lesbian, the next day as a gender fluid person. I experience them all at one time. And what often happens when you have multiple marginalized identities, you don't have the luxury of knowing when something happens, why it happens. That is one of the most exhausting parts of being a marginalized person. If you are white or heterosexual, cisgender, male, and certain income education level, and have all of those identities, you carry the greatest privilege in this country. And so, you know, there is kind of the luxury of if something happens, you can maybe just point it off to that person just being the type of person. When you're marginalized, you have no idea. And you're left with that feeling of wondering why that happened, why to that person, they may just kind of, it may just be a thing. Um, and so inter intersectionality is really important, it's very complex, and oftentimes people come at the conversation of race and gender equality and sexuality as if we have the innate capacity to talk about and deconstruct this very complex conversation. So I can an Put, provide an analogy of we can all run, right? That's an innate thing. We have two legs. We get up and do it. What is the difference between us and Olympia track runner? <laughs> that is the conversation between race and sexuality and gender identity and um, intersectionality. Simply because you carry marginal, marginalized identities does not mean you have had the conversation and know how to be constructed. Simply because you're a person in privilege does not mean you know how to be constructed. And we see these um, affecting health. There's a significant gap in um, age when you look at race, when you look at sexuality. Um, the trans community, especially if you're a trans person of color, the life expectancy age doesn't even really reach 50. But the average expectancy age is 78. And that's more than white hair. That is significant increase when you start to add race, sexuality. Expression. So there's something happening here. And think of to yourself, some of the things that you can do is what's happening here, is having these conversations, but also having cultural competency trainings. Understanding that the very places that microaggressions and implicit bias happens the most are the very organizations that are responsible for leading this charge. Because the assumption is, I can't possibly feel oppression. So my time is up. <laughs> um, but I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation on the health issue and what it looks like in conversations like this. Thank you so much. I, I, you made me think I was just uh, over at the Ford Foundation I think it was yesterday, and it was a conversation with people with disability, blind, hearing disabled, and somebody got up and said something I've heard many times before, but I needed to hear it again. And he said, no conversation about us without us. That if you're going to do planning for a group of people, they better be at the table and part of the planning. And so often, privileged people plan for marginalized people, and that's just not one of them. That was my takeaway from your remarks. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Tanya Hernandez, uh, and I teach law at Fordham University School. In New York City, uh, and we couldn't plan it better, Dr. Motley, um, mm -hmm. because what I have to say about law sort of cues up very nicely with what you were uh, sharing with the group. Um, I teach anti-discrimination law, amongst other things, and one of the most um, problematic aspects, of many, <laughs> of, with regards to our anti-discrimination law in the United States, is that it is organized around silos. Uh, and by that I mean is that uh, if you look at the federal level of anti-discrimination law, like Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, it is categorized, meaning you can bring a lawsuit if you've been discriminated against, based on your gender, check the box, or race, check the box, etc. Uh, and if you want to be able to express to the court that, well, you are a woman of color who is transgender, that is not something that our legal system has easily developed. Right? I mean, it's uh, people's lives, but the uh, lived experience doesn't necessarily match up with the jurisprudence. Um, and so, I'll give you one example of how that can play itself out. Uh, because if you have some, oh, 
because you're trying to decide something about this. If you have an individual like Dr. Mount who described it, you know, something happened, but they don't all quite know why. Right? Because if you're living at the intersection, it's like a traffic accident, you know, you may have gotten hit from the left, from the right. Oh, you know you got hit. You're not quite sure which direction. But if you're so fortunate, so to speak, that you can figure it out, you know, they use some racial slurs along with some uh, homophobic slurs, and so you've kind of figured out that these two things were in play and expressed that to the court. This is the problem that you might have. I'm going to give you a concrete example um, of a case that dealt with an African-American woman uh, claiming discrimination at her workplace. The court said to her, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals case from a number of years ago, said, well, you know, you say that black, that you as a black woman, uh, you're not being promoted and you're not getting the same salary increases, but this is an employer who hires and promotes and pays well for white women. So it's not a gender issue. It also, this employer has black men who are hired, promoted, and earn parallel salaries. So it's not a race issue. That you fall at the cross-section, well, sorry, we've done our analysis. You don't have a claim. Now, not all courts uh, are so restrictive in their analysis, uh, but this is not an aberrant case. So but the, what, that's why I bring it up as sort of the extremes of the example uh, of what it means when a court will not reflect in its legal jurisprudence the lived experiences that people that they are living intersections. Oh my goodness, today. Um, so, in response to this dynamic, which law doesn't mandate, Title VII doesn't mandate that you can only pick one. This is how courts have interpreted the legislation, but it need not do that. And so there are many legal scholars uh, who have taken up the mantle uh, from black feminists, or would be one of them, uh, amongst many, uh, talking about the issues of intersection. And in the legal context, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, another black woman from Columbia Law School, uh, has sort of transported many of the insights uh, from black feminism about intersectionality and fully more fully developed it in the legal context. Uh, and so in her writings, she looks at the ways in which intersectionality for lawyers means that this is the examination of multiple vectors of inequality and identity and how their combination uh, play out in various settings. Now, uh, what, oh, I got one minute to wrap it up. I'll say that uh, uh, within my own work, uh, the way I have tried to move forward with intersectionality is to highlight the ways in which it has been uh, problematic within one example of employment discrimination, that of sexual harassment. Uh, so what I'll close with is that in my own research, what I have discovered and tried to address are the ways in which women of color uh, are vastly disproportionately for, uh, represented in the number of claims filed. Doesn't this mean they are uh, experience more sexual harassment? That's an open question. You don't know. But if we're just looking at the number of cases filed, far more women of color file them than they represent in the workforce. Uh, white women, in contrast, are a much larger percentage of the civilian uh, labor force. And yet, in proportion, they have a, it's not on par. Do so white women not experience sexual harassment? I don't think so. Uh, but the, the, the way in which these things are disparate and go in different directions suggests, and if you want to know more, I'll tell you in the Q&A, uh, that sexual harassment is not a race-neutral topic, and that's the way it's often been addressed. And part of my work is to try to um, intervene uh, and uh, suggest ways to not have that be the case. That race, gender, and many other categories are not only intersecting, but mutually enforcing and mutually constructing one another. Thank you. Hi, so my name is Rishi Rapatra. Um, I'm part of Outright Action International. I'll just give you a brief overview of the kind of work that we do. So we are a global LGBT and human rights organization. We were founded 25 years ago and we're based in uh, New York City. Um, we train grassroots activists on security, advocacy, and on data collection. We partner with allies, like in the Philippines, we work with the police force to train police force how they can be more sensitive towards LGBTI communities to lower police aggression as well as profiling. Um, we monitor research and analyze um, systemic problems and um, collect data and uh, produce reports on based on different countries and communities, so assess you know, 
what is the LGBT rights situation in Iran or in Thailand? Um, and we also fund grassroots organizations and we advocate for accountability in the UN. Um, one of the things that we continually recognize is that you know, racism, class, gender, all of these other issues are, min are multiple minority statuses in which LGBT individuals face, oftentimes at the same time. And depending on the country that you come in, depending on the country context, the way that you voice this, and the way that the government polices you, or the way that your day-to-day -day life activities are um, impacted, really are different. So what we what we like to do, what we strive to do, is make sure that these voices are heard in the places that they need to be heard. So every December, what we do is we bring LGBT, 40 to 50 LGBT activists from around the world to the United Nations so that they can tell their stories. You know, oftentimes, as we've said in the past, there is a very particular type of person who is forcing the stories and the struggles of others. And in the United States, as we've seen that is, you know, pushing policies that are most advantageous to the cisgender white gay male. And that's not really the kind of oppression and the kind of laws and the kind of policies that need to be implemented maybe at a local level or at a country context that um, doesn't pertain to this individual body. So we make sure that these stories are heard right policies are put in play, and we put these discussions in an intersectional, intersectional context in which, you know, if you are a gay male that is, um, that can pass from being heterosexual in a community in India, you're not going to face the same types of oppression as if you are genderqueer female in India facing the same thing, you know, you're going to be forced to get married to someone that you're not going to be, um, that you're not going to want to get married to. If you're in Iran, there's no such thing as marital rape if you're a lesbian. So you're forced to get married to a man. You are continually subjected to um, sexual intercourse that you are not um, consenting to. But there's nothing that the law can do for you because you face arrested um, at the police level or in society. Um, so what we like to bring is the recognition that all of these intersectionalities exist. And at another level, when we talk about racism, we also talk about understandings of colonialism and how colonial legacy have put in place policies in places like India, in Malaysia, in Commonwealth countries in which penal systems and penal codes did not exist that criminalized um, same-sex sexual activity or homosexual activity. So if you look at India, because of colonialism, if you look at you know, any, any country that is, has an imperialistic background, the whiter you are, the more privileged you are. Right? Even if you are a dark-skinned Indian, you're told, get lighter, stay out of the sun. Right? The lighter you are, that equates to power, that equates to privilege. And so you fight this internalized social stigma that has been brought upon you because of colonialism, and at the same time, you fight within your, within your justice system or within your political system for laws that were imposed on your country that weren't there before you were there. And in that same sense, if you are a gay queer person in a place like Malaysia or India, and you're fighting against a penal code that was imposed on you because of British rule, you're facing homophobia at the level of policy makers and policy levels and religious leaders that are in there that force you to, you know, be more oppressed and marginalized. So these are a few of the conversations that we'd like to bring up in, in what we do. And the one thing that we have to continue to recognize is, you know, there are multiple minority oppressions. And when we have conversations about how do we create activism and how do we push the needle forward, we have to recognize that the voices aren't always going to be the same and policy decisions are always going to be the same needs across these communities. And my name is Jane <coughs> Bruce Ward. Um, I'm really honored to be here among these panelists. I'm very grateful for the organizers creating a space specifically for this intersectional conversation. Um, in introducing myself, I really want to start off the bat by naming that my work against homophobia and racism and for collective liberation is a direct extension of my religious upbringing, which tends to surprise some people. Um, that was a multi-religious upbringing, but especially in a Unitarian Universalist context. My teachers in church school when I was very young included transgender, lesbian, bisexual, and gay people. As a child, I never imagined that they might be excluded from religious community, which is a privilege in and of itself. And I was also activated for racial justice as a teenager. So from a young age, I really had the privilege of internalizing a deeply rooted belief in the inherent worth and dignity of all people, a knowing 
that my well-being was connected to the well-being of all people, and a hope that by building communities grounded in love and compassion, we might ultimately be able to build a just and equitable world. Um, it's been hard to describe my journey as a faith-rooted activist to my family abroad, so I've, I've said to my German family that dieser Weg ermöglicht mir meine tiefste Menschlichkeit einzugehen. Or in English, this path enabled me to live into my deepest humanity. Because ultimately that is what racism and homophobia and other systems of injustice do. They undermine all of our collective humanity, whether we are a direct target or not. So from that progressive religious upbringing, I felt called to devote my life to the common good. And that vocation has taken many forms, from teaching to advocacy, um, to managing political campaigns and mentoring activists of all ages. Currently, I serve as a seminary professor, training spiritual leaders to make change in religious and secular institutions. And as Bruce mentioned, I'm one of the senior staff members at All Souls Church in Manhattan, helping strengthen that congregation's efforts against racism, homophobia, and other systems of injustice. And I see some of our activists here, which is great. What I want to name, um, what I want to confess to is the truthfully when I reflect on the intersectionality of racism and homophobia, I'm reminded not only of successful efforts that I've been a part of, but really of missed opportunities. For example, one of my formative experiences as a community organizer was leading the interfaith effort against Proposition 8, um, which some of you might know was a ban on marriage equality in California, uh, which gained widespread media attention. I came into the campaign very energized because my vision for that campaign was broader than defeating that ballot measure alone. I wanted not only to raise the profile of religious communities as allies in struggles for LGBT rights, but I also wanted to develop leaders and build coalitions to work together on many issues for the long term. But I fell short of that vision. I remember being asked by a diverse inner city church whether I could mobilize their members not only against Proposition 8, but against two other ballot propositions targeting communities of color, which would divert resources from already underfunded public schools to expand our very broken prison system, and which would increase the criminalization of youth and immigrants. But instead of that vision that I had had, I had aspired to, I operated from a sense of scarcity, which too many of our social change efforts are limited by. I succumbed, as this historic high-profile campaign did, to the notion that there wasn't enough resources, there wasn't enough time or money or energy, or there wasn't, in a sense, enough justice available to address all of these issues, even though our campaign was resourced by millions of dollars in countless staff and volunteer hours. So I limited myself in this historic moment to working primarily with white, middle, upper class supporters of the LGBT issues. Certain issues, I would say, certainly not all issues affecting the much broader LGBT movement. And I still wonder, sometimes day after day, years later, how much stronger that campaign and other campaigns could have been, and how many longer term multi-issue coalitions could have been built if we were operating from an intersectional framework. Thank you. So we're going to go into a brief discussion here amongst ourselves in front of all of you, and then I'll open it up uh, to, to the wider audience. Um, before I do that, I, I want to mention, I was telling a story downstairs about how uh, I and my husband became the Unitarian Universalist. It was basically a fellow by the name of Stephen McDonald, who was at Dignity in uh, Washington, D.C., <coughs> And which is a gay uh, Catholic organization. And he kept telling me, he said, Bruce, you're a very spiritual person. You ought to be going to church. And you ought to be in a church that's affirming to you and, and your husband. And I said, there's no church that wants me. There's, there's, there's no place, any place that wants me. And uh, he just kept bugging me. He wouldn't leave me alone. So I finally came up with a list of conditions as to what kind of church I would accept to go to. And I said, uh, Hellfire and Brimstone, I don't believe in that, so I don't want to hear that stuff. It's got to be a church that will affirm my husband and I as a gay couple, and also my husband and I as an interracial gay couple. And then I had a bunch of other conditions. I forget what they were. But the whole point of my list was to make this guy shut up and stop <laughs> bothering me. 
And he said, without missing a beat, go to All Souls Church, 16th and Harvard, Washington, D.C. So I went home to Isaac there. And I said, okay, we're going to go to church on Sunday. And he said, no way, no way are we going. No, he said, I've been scarred by the church. I'm not going to anybody's church. So we fought for the entire week. I said, I don't want to go by myself. You've got to go with me. He said, I don't want to go. So we fought. Finally, Sunday morning, I pull him out of the house, you know, put him in the car, passive aggressive the whole way. He's like, no, I don't want to be going to this church. Got him into the church. Senior minister of um, All Souls Church in Washington, D.C., Rock Hardy, who's a gay man with a partner with children. The associate minister was Sean on Lynn Good, who was a person of woman of color with a partner and children. The, so the uh, social justice minister uh, was a, a, a woman in a same-sex relationship with, with children. So what I said earlier about no discussion of us, about us, without us, we saw ourselves mirrored in the leadership of that church. And Isaac, within 20 minutes, he gave him this big smile, that smile that he's got right now, and he said, yes, we're in the right place. And so we immediately joined. But just being in a place where we did not feel like we weren't wanted, because most places we didn't feel wanted. So with that in mind, what I want to ask the group here, what are the most pressing issues facing people of color and LGBT people, and what what forms of oppression do you see that are maybe prominent outside the United States? We can talk a lot about the U.S., but what can we kind of um, talk about outside of our borders and what are the root causes of oppression? Anybody can jump in. And one of the things that I did go to yesterday was um, the Black Lives Matter movement. And restricting the bodies of individuals who are the oppressed. Um, outside of that, you know, we forget to also talk about the intersection of homophobia and religion and um, sexuality and gender. And in many places around the world, you're very much fighting for your queer rights, but at the same time, you're fighting for your rights as a woman. You're not even recognized equally before the law, just for being who you are as a so in many of the places that we work with, we have to recognize that those are the things that we have to prioritize and then recognize that um, you know, marriage equality might not be the priority in a place like Croatia or in a place like Pakistan, right? It's about security, the security of the individual first. Um, trying to fight for um, anti-discrimination laws and things that will protect people regardless of their race or regardless of their religion, um, but because of their sexuality and not push more promises like marriage equality, which for many people is really further further down the line. Okay. Well, uh, maybe I'll talk about two things which I think are important. One is health, and the other one is uh, representation. And you know, I thought about health when Monica was uh, speaking. In all over the world, you, in the LGBT community, you find gigantic health disparities between uh, people of color and white uh, people. Um, and it's, you know, it's not always easy to understand what are the determinants, but uh, sometimes, you know, one of the determinants actually is the level of homophobia is particularly high against people. So, and so typically they will uh, have less access to health services, uh, but also they will have the impact of homophobia on their health, on their own self health care. And, and maybe another aspect is the fact that a lot of the public health campaigns are targeted and designed by people that do not have a good understanding of the experience. So you find gigantic health disparities not only in terms of HIV, but also in terms of mental health, and uh, and so that's you know that's something that definitely needs to be taken into consideration. And then the second point that that in my opinion is extremely important is the, the question that the discussion of group education, right? And that the feeling that, um, that even you know in the United States you will find leading LGBT organizations that are happy to take this. They have achieved a certain amount of diversity, but it doesn't translate into voice and it doesn't translate into leadership. 
mean that the leadership remains in the hands of gay, white, cisgender male. And, and even though you know, there's more representation, it doesn't really translate into a lot of I want to ask you about systematic uh, oppression in the workplace, and particularly as it applies to promotions and hiring. And how do we how do we deal with these deep seated systematic oppressions that are deeply ingrained in the workplace situation? Well, I mean, the very first thing that I want to point out is, um, from the LGBT perspective, uh, in particular, is that at the federal level, there is no right not to be discriminated against uh, based on your sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, there are some ways to try to work it through gender inequality, but it's not a good thing. Let's just put it that way. It's not expansive enough, expansive enough uh, as opposed to actually having your own explicit right uh, not to be discriminated against. There is at both the state and municipal level across the country um, some protection specifically to LGBT rights. Um, but because they're at the state and municipal levels, it tends to be, um, there are systems that are overtaxed. That is to say, so for instance, in New York City, if you were to file a claim um, before the Division of Human Rights, your claim takes a really long time to be processed because they're just overtaxed. They don't have the same resources as if you were to go to the EEOC at a federal level claim uh, just based on uh, your uh, ethnicity or race. Uh, so I'll point that out. Um, within the workplace itself, uh, these are the patterns that I have been observing. Uh, that workplaces are, I'm sorry, my time is up, so I'll just say, they're happy to talk about diversity as a nice, big, comfortable notion. Um, not with any particular actual benchmark numbers. Um, in the United States, we don't like the word quota. Uh, the Supreme Court has actually outlawed it uh, from the perspective of race uh, and gender. Uh, but internationally, uh, in Brazil, for example, to name another part of the world, okay, uh, quotas are equivalent to affirmative action. Right? They're not only allowed to be spoken of, that's how affirmative action is understood. Like if you really want to talk about integration, then you have hard target numbers uh, for uh, inclusion in public sector uh, workplaces and in uh, uh, public universities. Uh, so uh, the other thing that workplaces are happy to do is they're happy to talk to you about implicit bias. And I have nothing opposed to talking about implicit bias, but implicit bias without talking about structural inequality uh, is incomplete. Uh, and so there's still a lot of work that needs to be done uh, to bring on board the corporate sector uh, for transforming the workplace uh, for true uh, social justice. Can I add to that? Yeah, but well, I want to ask you another question. Okay. You can add to that. Yes. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, too. Okay, that, And you put the two together if you okay. want to. But so part of what we've been talking about a little bit here is sometimes you have queer white people that tend not to understand the whole issue of racial oppression. And you've got people of color who don't understand the oppression of people based on the sexual orientation. And these are both oppressed groups. What is limiting their ability to show compassion and understanding for each other and in coming together? They were, you were going to say, but also if you want to address this as well. Absolutely. Um, so I was, I was going to add to a comment point as far as um, what happens in the workplace, and, and this is some of the work that I do at Virginia Tech, working specifically with STEM offices, is that a lot of times in the workplace, we meet with this kind of cultural lens of the work is all that matters. The science is all that matters. As long as you can come in and you're an engineer and build this bridge, that's all we care about. As a science and scientist, as long as you can come in and look at these cells and then look at these pathogens, you can find cures for disease, that's all that matters. And the issue with that is there's this really large limitation about the people behind the work. And that it's not something that you do on your own time. As long as you can do the job, that's what matters to us. But if you're experiencing some type of oppression or microaggressions, that's really on your own to go and figure that out. So that's not really what we do here. 
And so that's, I think, some of the imperative parts um, about uh, improving the environment, the nonverbal, verbal, physical, and invisible spaces of the workspace is really getting to a point of helping people understand there's people behind this work. So if I, as a black queer woman, come into a space at a university, I recognize that I'm cut off. I recognize that I have to say my title for people to lean in and put their phones down because usually I'm not the one they assume has the PhD in the room. Um, and then I have to deal with someone saying something homophobic or transphobic, and then I have to make a decision in my mind. Okay, do I stand up, say something, disrupt, and deal with the aftermath that I know that's going to come, either being ignored, either being pointed as an angry black person, as a person that always wants to talk about race, or do I let that sit with me all day long while those people move on about their day? And I'm sitting here spinning. And so that's when working in training STEM labs and STEM graduate students, we have to have that cultural competency training. Because that first inclusion is like, you know, there's buzzwords, there's words right. that are very authentic, yeah. and then they become buzzwords because everyone's saying it, and then it loses its entire meaning. So people are okay with diversity and inclusion, but now we're saying identity and awareness. You have to understand who you are as an individual to understand how you communicate, how you show up, why you see that person be the way that they are, then that connects to partnership synergy, team building, teamwork, finding the best solution. But it's our lens then really lead us to decide kind of what are the medical and scientific breakthroughs. And I'll give you one quick example and I answer your question. For example, what we know is Latino and African American men have the highest rates of prostate cancer and less likely to get screenings for prostate cancer. We have no idea what that looks like in Latina and black transgender women. There is very little research about that. So imagine what we're missing in health and science. Medical breakthroughs for an entire community. And if you have someone that is Latino, Latina, or African American, or person of color in a science lab that wants to address and move forward in this type of work, but they're dealing with their own discrimination in, in, in the workplace. How that it keeps us from medical breakthroughs, literally how that keeps us from changing the trajectory of lives. Now to this question, I want to know what so I cannot speak for the entire team of black people. Um, and, we are, and we are not monolithic. So I can put it in the context of rule. Um, because disproportionately, when you talk about rural communities, the trajectory is worse. Um, and I think the siloing, some of the siloing that happens between racial equality in black communities and communities of color and um, LGBTQ equality is really this issue on internalized oppression. Mm -hmm. And what we have been taught from this larger society of who we should be and what things should look like. So, for example, this connection, as you said, between race and religion. Sometimes, I mean, the black community experiences, and I think the Latino, Latino black communities experience some of the greatest homophobia in the religious community. But that comes from this internalized oppression, oppression and belief of who we're supposed to be as people and try to compare and be of value in comparison to white America, and then we have this horizontal possibility of suppression. But we take in these beliefs of we're supposed to sound this way, we're supposed to look this way, we're supposed to dress this way, and if you don't, there's something wrong. And if there's something wrong, you're not the cause. So I think that it, it's a very large, complex question, but that's just a part of the siloing that with an internalized oppression and racism, this is horizontal hostility. People looking at each other in the very same community having hostility towards each other. Because we've been taught that there's something wrong with the reflection that you see. So Betty Jean, I'm gonna ask you a somewhat kind of difficult question. I'm only asking <laughs> difficult questions here. Um, religion is both a perpetuator of oppression and a and it combats oppression. And I what is it about theology, what is it about religion, that in one sense, you know, oppresses people, and in, in another sense is a champion to, to liberate people? What is it that kind of unpack that for us a bit? Sure. So I found myself attending seminary um, not with the idea of becoming an ordained religious professional, but knowing that I wanted a spiritual grounding for activism and organizing. And I fought back against so much of what I was hearing in seminary and all this theological speak, and I demanded from my professors and my fellow students the most simple, basic understanding of what theology is. 
and theology, as one of my classmates told me, is the frameworks with which we make meaning of our lives. And that was so powerful for me, and that, that says to me how deeply rooted a role that theology and religion can play. That these are the frameworks with which we make meaning of our identities, of our families, of our purpose on this earth, of our relationship to fellow human beings, of how and whether issues are connected to each other. So there's tremendous potential um, for, I don't like the good evil dichotomy, but there's tremendous potential for many, many different ways for theology and religion to take force in the world. Um, and that's why I also think it's, it's very important to um, lift up, for example, the diversity of roles that religion and theology plays in the world with regard to social justice and social issues. Um, I don't take it lightly to help represent the religious left. Um, the religious right tends to, at least in this country, get most of the political power, most of the um, influence. Um, and I also don't like that religious right and left dichotomy because I've worked with people, uh, people of faith across a very broad political spectrum. But I think I always um, appreciate the challenge and the surprise that I see when people see that religion and theology can mean so many different viewpoints and so many different points of action and activism on social issues, especially against racism and homophobia. Thank you. And Fabrice, so the Free and Equal campaign, which is somewhat aimed at the LGBTQI population, does that also embrace issues of race and other kinds of marginalization? If we want to help the Free and Equal, how does that play out for all of the people and all of the forms of multiple oppression that we're talking about as well as oppression. Right, so for free and equal, uh, it, you know, the target is definitely not the LGBTI community. So the target is basically the broader community, particularly people that are in the middle, and, uh, you know, to get an understanding of the need for greater inclusion of LGBTI people. Uh, the truth is that we have not done much on trying to build alliances with other social movements. I think that's something that we definitely uh, want to do, uh, to do more. Um, and, and in a way, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, sometimes it's a little difficult. Even structurally, you, know, you have, you have, you know, in institutions like the United Nations, you have, uh, you have different uh, silos that do not connect to each other. When I was working at the World Bank, I remember that uh, I really wanted uh, the gender group to start including LGBTI issues as part of, uh, of their Monday. And they were, they were strongly opposed to it. And the reason they were opposed to it is that they felt that they had struggled so hard to gain legitimacy as an issue, as an economic development issue, that they would undermine themselves by including LGBTI issues, by even more controversial. And, uh, and to me, it was kind of short-sighted because <coughs> You know, what is at the root of gender issue is hegemonic masculinity, and that's also related to, uh, to the to LGBTI issue. And, and if you tackle hegemonic masculinity through LGBTI issue, you're actually probably gaining a lot of ground on gender issues. And I think that's the same thing for all uh, different types of discrimination. If we are in a society that is less racist, if we are in a society that is more inclusive, people that have disability, if we are in a society that is, uh, that is looking, you know, at all minorities in an inclusive manner, then we are gaining traction against the And uh, so I think, you know, for free and equal, as, uh, you know, the challenge, as, as Monica was going to point out, is already to, to challenge our own bias, on our own uh, prejudice. Uh, but I think the next step is to be the alliance and the uh, well, I would like to open it up now for brief questions, please, so we can get as many questions in the front of us. Um, so I'm an atheist, and that's kind of the intersection that I'd like to hear more from the panelists about how a lot of the times they say, okay, well, we're a church that accepts you, and it's like, I don't believe in God, so it's like literally an issue that I don't hear much about, especially if you're black and atheist and queer, it's like a, a, a triple marginalization there. So if I could hear some um, commentary. That. And I'd like to kind of do what the UN wants to do, is take three questions at a time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come to them together, so yes, one. Yes. Um, 
Hi, Grove Harris with the Temple of Understanding. Thank you for this outstanding panel, and I really appreciate looking at your bios. I wanted to ask about some what are known as intersectionalities. Um, so one is about the role of misogyny or <coughs> hatred of women. I think that took place, you can see it in Orlando, just the hatred of gay men is actually a hatred of women at some level because they're being womanish, and it plays out differently where lesbians in some ways are given some slack because what women do doesn't matter at all, but men transgressing really does matter. Um, another piece on that is intergenerational issues because I appreciated uh, Dr. Motley's comments about uh, the internalized violence because myself as a lesbian woman now I need to adopt different labels. I need to think about gender fluidity and being queer and how do I relate to trans women who are not feminist. These are all challenges that are different from 30 years ago when I think about relating to other generations and defining myself now. And then the last intersectionality is a, a colleague of mine in the women's major group mentioned that her experience is that Folks from the Global South experienced discrimination in the gay rights movement. And I can't speak to that personally, but I know that that kind of discrimination does occur um, North-South power imbalances. So those are just three intersectionalities I've put on the table for this uh, fabulous conversation. Yes. In the back, uh, Rabbi, is that you? Did yes, I well, see your hand? Yes, no, actually... I wanted to, to uh, welcome us, number one, say good morning, uh, good afternoon to everyone. But uh, the universal no-hide code actually promotes peace and harmony. And what, what people do in their bedroom is, is should be kept, to, you know, should be private. And the government and, and people shouldn't, shouldn't judge anyone by race, religion, or, Rabbi, or call. Okay. Brief question. Okay, brief question. How do we unite all three religions, major religions, as pe well as people, non-believers, into a common goal and a common, uh, common, uh, a common, uh, a common law, so Thank to speak. You. Thank you. All right. So as I sort of summarize the questions, I mean, where, where do atheists fit into all of this? How do we work this place for atheists? Uh, I think there's the, the issue, the question of misogyny, also intergenerational. Uh, Saturday, I'm going to celebrate my 67th birthday, so as an aging gay man, that's, you know, age, get some age in there, and global south and racism, and how do we, how do we um, look at religion, particularly the three Abrahamic religions, and what the rabbi is referring to, how do we in the religious discourse? You know, I would love to take briefly the Muslim question, uh, because it can relate to whatever talking about uh, a minute ago. I mean, you know, as much as when I, you know, when I, in my introductory remarks, I talked about the fact that the LGBTI community is, you know, unfortunately, uh, very racist, right? And, and we have seen it in uh, many cases, and we have to do a lot of work inside our community. It's extremely misogynistic. And, um, and beyond being misogynistic, it does, it does uh, uh, tremendous issue with masculinity. And we, you know, even worse than maybe a few decades ago, I mean, today, our community is kind of obsessed with masculinity. And if pushing away, particularly uh, gay men, are pushing away you know, uh, their, their femininity. And, uh, you know, I always say that uh, when, I, when I came out, to me the most, uh, you know, I used to work at the World Bank and I used to always be ashamed when I was straight men, what I realize now in retrospect that, that I've completely integrated the fact that straight men were uh, superior species to mine. And, you know, I would blush when I would talk to them. Only when I came out very openly, I did feel more empowered in the discussion with straight men. But even now, they, they have a little bit of very sense of that. And I think that sometimes we make the mistake of not pointing out our hegemonic question extremely destructive to our society. And, uh, and our community, has, you know, so, so our community is extremely obsessed, you know, women are very obsessed by people appearance and by muscles, and it's, mm -hmm. it's so much linked, it's so much linked to this belief that masculinity is superior and is better. And you know, when I was talking about the horrendous tagline that you find on sexual networking applications that says no black, no femme, no fat, 
I mean, what it says is basically, you know, I hate myself, right? I hate the femininity in me. I hate, you know, uh, body non-conformity, and I hate, you know, uh, diversity. So, so, you know, I, unfortunately, what is terrible is that even as openly gay men, sometimes we carry with us the same oppression Me as a lesbian really working in the LGBT community, I've heard the most of myself in the same thing as I'm in the game, right? Because these are men who love men and women who still exist in that like periphery. And in a sense, you know, you go out to clubs, sometimes the most hostile places like, are really built. Um, you know, you're very ostracized there. It is very pervasive. Um, in the Asian Pacific, one thing that has tended to exacerbate that um, privilege has been funding. So, funding <coughs> coming from two places like Thailand, two places like Vietnam, two places where there's been epidemics of like HIV and prevalence of HIV, a lot of LGBT movements have been progressed forward with public health funding. And public health funding have very particular targets. Until there was a discussion about human rights as they related to LGBT people, it was gay people are, you know, perpetuating the HIV epidemic in the itself. So organizations that have the most capacity um, are MS, men like MSM organizations or trans organizations that have had historic funding capacity that have to focus on issues of um, human rights as they pertain outside of that, um, I guess, aspect. Um, and that funding issue also impacts, you know, the Global South, right? Our funding, the funding that goes to the Global South, comes from the Global North. So if you don't have these connections, if you don't speak English, if you can't, you know, understand the system of how you get that money, you will be discriminated from that process. You will not get funding. Um, you're not going to get it from your government. The government doesn't have the budget to do that. And in most places, you know, let's say you live in a place like in Pakistan or in another place where your sexuality is criminalized, you are not going to seek out that funding. Um, in, and the last thing, when we think about misogyny and masculinity, and we think about the legal system, um, many penal codes don't recognize that sex between women is some, right? It's very much between two men. And in some places, like Iran, whether you are the penetrator or the one being penetrated, there's two different um, penalizations for it. So if you're the one being penetrated, you're viewed more as a woman, right? And in that society, you're less of a human being, right? Because it's a very patriarchal society. So if you're the one, you know, if you're the one penetrating someone else, like you'll get a slap on the wrist. But if you're the one being penetrated, you're going to be put in jail or be in jail. Because you're becoming more feminine. And James, you handle our religious questions, <laughs> atheism, and, and all of these things. Like, we'll put on your plate. Okay, fair enough. Um, I'll say all of these questions. I think could merit their own panel and yeah. far extended discussion. So I'll try to give just a tiny little snapshot of my thoughts. Um, first of all, I feel very strongly that atheism needs excluded people from the spiritual community. Um, the spiritual communities that I've been a part of, have included people who are spiritually seeking, who are religiously questioning, where question and doubt are welcome and encouraged, um, where people identify as atheists, as agnostic, as multi-religious, as evolving in their beliefs. Um, personally, I'm not interested in a religious community that would exclude or stigmatize people with those beliefs, but I know that's, in some cases, a minority view. Um, how to unite religious and non-religious people to a common goal? Um, I feel like that's the great opportunity and the great human social experiment that I'm interested in, and I'm so glad that many of you here are interested in. Um, it's, it's no easy task to both find um, shared values and commonalities where it seems that our perspectives are so distinct. Um, I remember when I was involved in racial justice work um, with a far-left secular organization, and we were trying to do outreach to people in our lives about why we were doing this work against racism, and I literally had to take our annual report, pretty much throw it all out, and rewrite it and translate it for my conservative Christian relatives 
to start from the values that they passed on to me that I deeply cherish, and that even though they were manifesting different in my life, there was a commonality there. Um, I also think that living in the world that we live in right now, a global world, um, a very diverse world along racial, sexual, class, gender, religious, and other identities, um, it is imperative that we learn how to coexist across differences. Um, and I think there's incredible richness and rewards to be found from listening to diverse type of perspectives, um, being open to what we might not understand or agree with, but also listen deeper and make space for that relationship wherever it can take us, hopefully to a place of that commonality and unity. I want to address something that nobody else has chosen to address. It's the, the whole issue of intergenerational and, and age. Uh, we're a very youth-oriented culture, being young is beautiful, whether you're a woman or a man, and if you're old, it's not considered beautiful, and why not? Since the MVP one, a beautiful actor, and <laughs> beautiful men and women that are, you know, 80 years old, uh, there are, obviously, but we don't, that, that's not valued in, in many of our cultures, I mean, more maybe in some Asian cultures, I think there's a greater respect towards for people um, older, I've certainly experienced that in my uh, and I think the LGBT community is particularly egregious in, 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 in not respecting the uh, older holders. So I just want to lift that up as, as an additional area of the community. So, see a hand in the back? Pat, yes. Hi. Um, I want to just uh, say that I think that the Asian and just to say that, uh, as a seminary educated person, my experience, and I believe this to be the experience across the board for seminaries, is that we know full well that we cannot use the Bible, for example, to justify our prejudices, homophobia, that kind of thing. But we do it anyway, that's party line. And so I, I think part of what we have to do as activists is, for example, find ways into these interreligious councils, for example, I've worked in Uganda some, but I cannot find a way into the interreligious council there, which uh, includes Anglicans and Catholics and other kinds of Christians, who agree to a common message in that country and to perpetuating that message. But I think if we could get in there and have a conversation, we could say things like, and, and I know I would be the wrong person because I don't speak in a politically correct way, but we could say things like, like cut the crowd. You cannot use Leviticus or whatever you want to use. That, that's not what it says, and people know that. They're at least as educated as I am. So I think part of what we have to do around religion is stop pussyfooting and say, <laughs> why are you pretending like you have a justification for what you continue to teach people? When in fact, no matter if you went to an AME seminary, if I was educated in a Roman Catholic seminary, a Lutheran seminary, a Presbyterian seminary, someplace like Union, you know better. You know better. And until we're willing to really speak the truth ourselves, instead of being afraid to really say what is reality, I don't think we're going to get any place with religion as both a perpetrator and a combatant. It's just, it's just going to be, we'll have some nice guys and some bad guys. But having said that, my question is, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the global perspective and what people think the top three global issues are for us since um, the reality is that we can't just kind of be the United States working on this or um, Britain working on this or Canada working on this. Like, what are the top three things that you think we should be addressing? <coughs> Thank you very much. And for those who don't know her, this is Reverend Pat Gardner. At least the in charge here of Metropolitan Community Church here in New York and probably wider. So we're honored to have you here and thank you for your question. That's a pretty big question, and I think at least it deserves an answer. So. I, you know, I mean, one, one uh, probably three decriminalization of homosexuals. And, you know, it's not that there's just intersection of racism and homophobia, but I think that this is, uh, and you know, in a way it is, actually. Because, you know, as I pointed out, a lot of the law that are on the book and, and you know, uh, our friend from our right to point it out too, is that those laws were, uh, were part of colonialism, right? particularly in the Commonwealth. And they 
were, you know, they were pushed by racism. And you couldn't tell them what racism is. They imposed those values, those homophobic values, and now, uh, now they are able to adapt to the deal. And religion has to play a key role. And to be very frank with you, I, you know, the, the line of the, of the Catholic Church is that they are not for the communication of homosexuality, and I just cannot understand from you. I mean, you know, what is there to gain in criminalizing homosexuality? <coughs> and, uh, you know, criminalizing homosexuality has tremendous negative consequences. It leads to gigantic violation of human rights. But not only for people that are prosecuted. Right? It also has, you know, it, it, it leads to, to it prohibits social change and it leads to, to gigantic uh, mental health issues for our community. And to me, that's not extremely difficult to achieve. We should be able to find a common ground on the fact that you might not, you might disagree with homosexuality, you might disagree with non conforming gender but you can agree that there's nothing to gain in criminalizing the situation. And, uh, and so to me, that's, that's a key global priority we should rally around. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, although some things can happen in the world, still currently criminalizing sexuality, and 10 countries in the world have death penalty for anyone engaging in this behavior. Um, and what that is, you know, is up to the authority. It's a very blurry line. What is on the um, besides that, another would be, you know, um, aiming away from legal gender identity recognition, um, giving trans individuals the rights without the need for surgical, for surgery of colonization to access uh, gender identity recognition. Um, and I, I guess another one um, would definitely be ending normalization and unconsented, unnecessary surgery on intersex bodies. Um, so uplifting self-identification and body autonomy. Do you want to explain that a bit more? Because I, 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 I fear that for the general population, people don't even understand the effects. It is talked about more here at the UN than just about any place else. Do you want to unpack that just a little bit more? Sure. So, you know, when we talk about discrimination and um, when we talk about presence, we say LGBTI, the acronym, very often. And we clump intersex human rights within the larger acronym of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender um, immigrants without really representation from the intersex community or without any kind of even understanding of the broader LGBT community on, you know, what are the human rights of intersex people. So intersex individuals are individuals that are born with um, maybe gender with, with gender characteristics of both male and female. And there are many ways in which that can be um, Exemplify. At times it's physical, at other times it's just internal. So let's say someone can have, um, you know, male chromosomes but presenting as female. Um, oftentimes, intersex individuals, while they are babies, between you know 48 hours of being born, because of the societal constructs of gender binary, um, parents are pressured to choose for their children whether they want to have surgery on the children to be and confined within the male or the female sex. Um, these surgeries are irreversible, they are painful, they have lifelong consequences, oftentimes they impact the sexual function of an individual, and it's happening to babies who have no, or children who have no agency to give that consent to themselves. Um, so, the intersex community has been historically underfunded. I think the statistic, and don't quote me on this, is like 1% of global LGBTI funding goes towards intersex communities. So there's really little representation. Um, this is being brought up at the United Nations level, where organizations have um, submitted shadow reports to the Committee um, for the Protection of the Rights of the Child, as well as the Committee Against Torture, um, indicating that this is, this is um, you know, things that are happening to our bodies against our will and without our consent. Um, so in doing that, there is, there is a global push. There's only currently one country in the world that Legislation that's Malta that bans um, surgeries on the intersex bodies. And listening to that and connecting it, because I'm learning more, especially about the global perspective, um, and I always have to put this back around, it sounds very similar to what happens in the rural South mm. with these issues that are right under our noses. Again, people don't know the name of Virginia is on the map, but Pulaski, Virginia, or Fairbairn, North Carolina, but there's still very much those same similar practices that are happening right here 
um, in our own home. I mean, it's still very, I won't say very common, but it's common for sexual orientation, psychology, reversal practices to happen in faith-based spaces and other places. I keep coming around to this um, aspect of kind of faith-based work and, and everything that everyone's saying that I'm learning about because the, the major question I think comes up, um, as I think Reverend Pat has mentioned, when you're from somewhere like the so, um, the question then becomes, how do we then provide the financial resources, support, and capacity work that's needed to help move forward these issues? Because I agree, you shouldn't pussyfoot the, as your friend said, I feel like it's okay because Reverend Pat said it first. <laughs> I said it anyway. Um, how do we get faith leaders, because we cannot deny that religion is a centralized part of the global part of the American fabric. There's studies that show that even when people um, are atheists or non-denominational, they turn to some form, 60% of Americans turn to some form of divinity or higher universe or being to, to deal with things such as um, illness and death. And so a part of the issue that I see is, one, understanding how different denominations work, especially culturally depending on the community. So part of my family is Muslim, the other part is Christian Baptist. When you're thinking about Baptist denominations, there is really no hierarchical kind of larger organization where if it's set up here, then it trickles down and that's what it is. Versus with Methodist denominations, there is this very hierarchical, if it comes from the top, people just do, right? So you have to, it's important to think of how do people get their permission to move forward with the social justice issue around um, racism and homophobia? Um, and then same with, you know, in the Muslim community, where does that come from? Um, and um, I think the other part of that in talking about um, racism, homophobia, and faith communities, especially in the rural South, is it's also an issue of, especially in the black community, religion being a very centralized part of how people dealt with oppression especially because psychologists and therapists were not a viable option. It's such a strong act of the way. Go talk to your pastor. Go talk to your clergy person. So culturally, you're dealing with a community where religion has been such a salient aspect of escaping oppression. Um, but then you're also dealing with the internalized oppression of power that religion so the intentionality of keeping out stories such as Joseph and Josephine, which is a story, a biblical story, about an anointed transgender individual. Mm -hmm. Celebrate it. We talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, we do not talk about Sodom and Gideon. And I am by no means a theologian or a historian, but you know, my mother's an ordained minister, my, my best friend has a master's in divinity, and those stories are excluded from the, from the conversation of the religious fabric that oftentimes oppress communities of color regarding racism and homophobia. Why? Because there is power in knowledge. And we've seen it over and over again how religion can be such a powerful tool of oppression. People take that on. So I think that's a part of the conversation of then how do we get folks like yourself down to areas like mine to be a part of the movement because we're still dealing with the Confederacy and the you get what I'm saying? So we have to have this movement of not just being in New York. Where do folks come to places like this that say, listen, I can say these things because people here might not be comfortable saying it. Because that's a big thing, right? It's hard to talk to my white family members about racism. I'm here. I'm in your family. Who do you mean? <laughs> right? But that doesn't necessarily prevent them from still utilizing the vulnerability of their whiteness. Kelly is Thank standing you. behind me because she's giving us a look. I just want to say one quick thing now, and then it's all good. Um, I, I so agree with what you're saying about religion. I, I think of David, who says in the Psalms to, to Jonathan, he says, Jonathan, the love of Jonathan is sweeter than that of a woman. What is, what is that? I mean, it sounds <laughs> like something I might say. Um, and also, uh, there are statistics that say one in a hundred babies are born with both 
gender characteristics, both male and female gender characteristics. That's a much higher figure than most people uh, are willing to accept. And we go around saying, well, marriage is between a man and a woman without realizing we're not as binary as we like to think of ourselves. That Kelly. Awesome. Kelly. Thank you so much. This was awesome. I really do apologize that we don't have time for more questions or answers, but you guys did a great job. Um, if you're live streaming, I think we're going to click it off so we can do our activities, but thank you for joining us virtually. Um, we will send a follow up link with how to access the video afterwards. And now I'm just a little bit.